Hello chess lovers! Today in this video we are going to have a look at the Benoni structure and we are going to explore and analyze the main plans for both sides and uh, we are going to hopefully get a better idea about how to play uh, this particular structure on either side. So without further ado, let's jump in and identify first and foremost what this structure looks like. So the pawn formation is the key uh, almost all the time when it comes to identifying structures. And here we are going to take a look at these four pawns. These four pawns create what we often like to refer to as the Benoni structure, predominantly because most of the times this particular pawn formation actually occurs in the Benoni defense, or more accurately, the modern Benoni that features this e6 move followed by the trade on d5. So let's have a look at this position and discuss uh, the respective plans for both white and black. As you can see, unlike the French structure that we discussed in the previous video um, that was uh, made in a very similar fashion about structures, here the pawn structure features a little bit of an imbalance. So it's not symmetrical. White has got the pawns looking this way, black's pawns are looking that way. We also notice that uh, if we draw a line between the C and D files, that white has got a pawn majority on this side, on the king side slash center, with his five pawns, one, two, three, four, five, against four of blacks. But on the other hand, black has got three against white's two on the other side. So this pawn structure is mostly known for all these unique imbalances and uh, the matching plans are likewise quite uh, opposing, if you will. So the first and uh, most typical plan for white to play in this structure is to aim to break through with a uh, central push e4, e5. Now this is a lot easier said than done. And although there are multiple variations that are very strongly based and built around this idea, it's not every day that we get to actually execute this push. The second idea for white is a lot more subtle and is often difficult to understand. So when you are see, observing grandmasters, top end grandmasters playing on the white side of the Benoni, sometimes you see some very strange maneuvery games where it's not quite clear uh, what exactly is going on. But white has a strategy that is really fundamentally based on the idea that the pawn structure that you see in front of you now secures a quite sizable space advantage. And so all white is trying to do is to keep all minor pieces, all the four of them on the board and stir the game towards a, a maneuvery type of uh, scenario where black having also four pieces on the board will find it difficult uh, after a while to actually improve his position and put his pieces on gradually better squares simply because there is not enough room around. Now, as for black, and uh, for this reason I'm going to now flip the board around, the two main plans that black has is, uh, the, the number one uh, is a6, b5 expansion on the queen side, and then push those pawns as far as they possibly can go. Very often we end up uh, doing a6, b5, c4, and then this knight comes into c5 aiming to land on d3. The other plan, which is far less common, is, is that black often, in fact in the Benoni almost always, puts the bishop on the, fi uh, develops fianchetto, so on g7. And so after g6, very often you find that black can, as a secondary plan, opt to go for f5. Like I said, it's not a, a, a main plan, not a typically something that black would aim for, but as a secondary slash backup plan, it can uh, function rather well. And so, and last but not least, black also is aiming to, uh, one of the greatest plans for black really is to stop white achieving his plan, which was to break through with e5. And in fact, black really enjoys putting a knight on e5. And uh, if we can secure a knight on e5, that's usually desired. And last but not least, black also needs to focus on trying to trade at least one pair of pieces as soon as possible, so that that uh, previously mentioned uh, 
space advantage is quite manageable. So let's see what it looks like in the practice. Um, the first game I'm going to show you, I'm going to model you the main plan for white. So this is one particular way how the modern Benoni can occur. Um, and here white has got a huge range of variations that he can choose from. There is knight f3, there is h3, there is knight e2, there is f3, there is f4, there is bishop b5 check. Really an awful lot. f4 was played in our game and now white played bishop b5 check. Knight d7 dropped back and now you can see that there is a problem with development in the black camp because now the knight is blocking the bishop's path. So now white plays a4. The idea is that white knows that a6 is coming and if we pull the bishop back then black gets to play b5. We already touched upon this plan and so a4 is already shutting this down. Castles, knight f3 and knight a6. I knew that I forgot something. So another plan for black uh, in the Benoni is that if we can do this with the black knight and I'm going to turn the board around for this This b8 knight quite often develops to a6 and then to c7 and then black has this very slow But rather effective plan of a6 b6 rook b8 b5 Keep that one in mind as well Okay, dox so knight a6 castles knight c7 bishop d3 a6 Queen e1. White is really playing in a very aggressive fashion. Both e5 and f5, bishop g5, queen h4. Ideas are on the cards now and black's position appears to be remarkably passive. You can see that somehow it doesn't really feel right. The knights are on the seventh rank and not a lot of prospect for either of them. So the position is looking rather grim. Rook b8. And when black is just about to expand on the queen side with b5, comes the very thematic strike e5. And now white is in a commanding lead. Knight b6, anytime you have to put a piece, a minor piece in front of the b pawn in the Benoni, you already know that uh, trouble time is present. And from here on, Tukmakov, who plays this as white, just performs a beautiful attack. f5. I'm going to accelerate this part a little bit because it's not so relevant for our video. D, F, G, and he goes on, on, on an all-out assault that pretty much shreds the black's defense apart in a blink of an eye. Watch. Bishop G5, Queen D6, Queen H4, introducing the Bishop E7 threat. Knight D5, he's no longer interested in counting material. Rook D1, creating a semi-pin. C4. Knight takes d5, dc takes d3. Note that knight takes d5 would have lost to bishop takes c4, whereas queen d5 would be losing to bishop takes g6, and the tactics are deadly. So, d takes d3, knight check, king h8, and now comes the beautiful tactical strike number one, knight takes e5. Now, if bishop takes, then f8 is falling, and if the queen takes, then we have got knight takes g6, exploiting the pin, picking off the queen. So it turns out that the knight is immune. Bishop f5, a very logical move, trying to cover up the f-file and provide extra support to the g6 pawn. But Tukmako is having none of that nonsense. Boom, shki baby, sacrifices the rook. And now knight takes g6 is the threat, winning at least the queen. So e5 had to be captured. But rook takes e5 again is uh, just deadly. The rook is immune still due to this uh, knight fork. And so after rook f7, without waiting for white's response, black threw in the table and resigned. So this was a very, very powerful demonstration of what can happen in the Benoni if black doesn't get to execute his counterplay and he gets jammed behind uh, very, very passively on the seventh and eighth ranks and white just breaks through in the center and then sweeps everything away. Now, let's have a look at the black side of the business. I'm going to show you now some of the uh, black plans. We are going to look at a different variation. a6, a4, and bishop g4. A key move, and I already mentioned this to you, that black is trying to trade uh, off a pair of pieces. So bishop takes knight is actually desired for two reasons. Hey? The c8 bishop doesn't really have a good square in this structure because d7 is clumsy, these two are taken away, and so g4 is the only one that is left. 
but almost always that means automatically a trade. Now, the other reason why we like to do this is because it paves the way for the knight to come to e5. So knight d7, bishop f4, and queen c7. You can see that black here has a very firm control over the e5 square, unlike in the previous game. Queen e2, rook e8, again, typical uh, Benoni stuff. The rook very often comes to e8 to attack the e4 pawn and to support the knight. Bishop h2 back. So white is hoping here to play for f4 and then to e5, but somehow now we have got the exact opposite feelings of what we saw in the first game. It feels like black's position is quite harmonious. The pieces seem to be supporting each other. Everybody is on the very best squares. And after rook c8, we are ready for the thematic c4 push. And hopefully we will be able to back it up with b5. So bishop c4 was played, but again, we are usually happy to trade pieces in the Benoni. And so after f4, we happily eliminate the bishop on c4, queen c4, and now comes the other knight onto the same circuit. So the plan is still um, kicking off the queen c4 and then read out the knight to c5. But also note that knight d7 is a really awesome move to keep the pawn push at bay. Rook e1, queen b6, hitting b2 which is truly hanging because once I take it, c3 is going to be uh, in a lot of trouble along the long diagonal. But there is another additional plan, and that is queen b4. Endgame scenarios usually prefer black in the Benoni, and the reason behind that, again, is, is because black's majority on the queen side is a lot easier to utilize and... Uh, mobilize and make sure that they can roll up than these guys on the king side. e5 is a lot harder to execute in an endgame scenario than running these pawns on the queen side for black. So queen f1 was played, but now black has got this super thematic c4, 19, 19, b5, and white's position is just falling apart. Rook e2, b5 takes, takes king h1, and finally black decided that enough was enough and he just took the pawn on c3, and after a few more moves, he went on to win with the c2 pawn and the super aggressively plays knight, rook, queen combo that is about to pick off the e4 pawn. So this is a very typical uh, way to play for black, and this game was really working out perfectly well for the black side. Now what I'm going to have a look at with you is uh, a different scenario, different opening where no one would know what's going on unless we knew the structure. So have a look at the opening. It's actually a Nimzo, which is a totally different cattle of fish from uh, the Benoni. But after a little bit of a detour, you can see that it's a totally different piece layout to begin with. Knight d2, h6 back, c5, d5 takes, takes, castles, e4, and ta-da, our Benoni structure, d6 is inevitably coming, is already on the board after move 10. And it was a Nimzo. So now if this Nimzo player didn't know uh, the Benoni structure and uh, what's good and what's not so good in the Benoni structure, then it would be a lot harder for them to compare this position to what the structure indicates and find the matching plans. Now, if we really want to be good at chess, we really quickly have to pick up on the main differences and be able then to compare because here the differences are very stark and quite um, uncharacteristic for the, for the Benoni structure. The structure is there. You can see pawn, 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 pawn. But it's a world of a difference from the previous game. And I'm going to now tell you the main differences. Actually, as you can observe, the vast majority uh, or the largest number of differences are all on the black side. So let me uh, swap the board around. Number one, this bishop here is meant to be here on the long diagonal in the Benoni. The most potent uh, and powerful piece that black loves to rely on in the Benoni setups. Now, this is out on b4, and almost certainly uh, we will have to trade it off for a knight. So that's a big bzzz, not good. Secondly, the light squared bishop almost always stands miserably poorly 
on this diagonal because it's virtually biting into granite. Another reason why we really like to trade it off for that knight on f3, or alternatively, even going to a6 and trade it off for that bishop would be better than parking it on b7. Now, if we look at the white piece layout, that's perfect. That's exactly where you would put your pieces, even if it was a proper Benoni. So the comparison now tells us that white is actually a lot better off here and should have very clear advantage based on the fact that we know what structure it is, but black's uh, setup is far inferior compared to the Benoni. Bishop b5 was played, castles g5, knight h5 and f4. White wastes no time to crack open the king side, especially because these two pieces, the two bishops, are perfectly incapable of participating in the king side events. Knight g3 takes, c4, bishop takes, queen takes, and again, look at the two bishops. It's extremely rare that you would see two knights very heavily outmuscling two bishops, but here in this Benoni setup, this bishop desperately wants to be on g7, and this bishop desperately wants to be trading off itself for one of the knights. Instead, black is just getting mated here uh, very, very quickly. Queen h5, king g7, king h2. A prophylactic move removing the king from all potential checks. And after takes, takes the fabulous rook um, f6 decides the fate of the game. The rook is immune. And uh, otherwise, I have got this, we have got this, we have got this. The plan is that if takes, then queen h6 check, king g5, queen g5, and the king can't escape. It has to go to king f8. And after rook f1, the queen is going to drop and white is going to retain a very powerful attack. Last but not least, I would like to show you again that just because we know a structure with one color, it doesn't mean that it can't turn around. So here, we are going to now look at uh, a very odd uh, opening from the Benoni's point of view. So it starts off like some kind of, a, I don't even know what to call it, like a Reti type of English. Yeah, like I don't even know what to call this thing. Uh, the English is probably the best. However, here Black already recognizes that, hold on a tick, if I play here d4, take, take, and again, we always assume that d3 is inevitably coming in this structure sooner or later, because otherwise we can push this in and that's not gonna be pretty. So now we go like, hold on a tick. This is a Benoni structure, except it's reversed. So now the first instinct is that you go like, okay, so let's see the comparisons, what's right, what's not right. So white is doing what he's meant to do by putting this bishop on the long diagonal, but the other bishop is also on the long diagonal and I already told you that that's the worst. So now we have two arguments. White is a tempo up because he's playing a black system with white. But actually one of his pieces is utterly misplaced. So two moves at least have already been spent on putting a piece on the worst possible square, which means that it shall move at least one more time, making it free. Now we are black, so we lost the tempo. That makes it us being too tempy ahead in a Benoni structure. And a lot of people would go like, oh, it's a it's a white opening, sorry, a black opening with white. So I'm already too tempy down. It's terrible. And they don't realize that there is a lot more to it than just counting the tempi because the location of the pieces is actually super important. And so he starts playing just very soundly, knight f6, bishop b4 check. We have already seen this move utilized a great deal. And after knight fd2, he black is really turning on the aggression by bishop f5. So what black is saying now, and I really like it, is that your Benoni is so bad, I'm gonna punish you right away in the opening. And now white doesn't have the knight e4 move to block up the e4 square and cover the d3 pawn because of the pin. So queen e2 is forced, castles, a3, another unfortunate move. Here kingside castles was absolutely imperative. And look at this beauty. He just goes like, okay, well, you really messed up your Benoni brother. So I'm going to punish you. And he goes, bishop c3. Now this is really a, a, a perfect demonstration of a chess player 
not only recognizing the structure, but also identifying that this is played really subpar. And so he goes like, I'm not going to treat it like a Benoni. I'm going to treat it like a misplayed one. And I'm going to punish you for what you have done. And there it is. Bishop c3. Total disaster. Because if either capture happens, in the end I take d3. And the king will be stuck in the middle. Total disaster. So rook a2 was played. And from here on, white is not playing... Ben Sorry, black is not playing Benoni. Black is now playing chess. And he just goes like, boomski. Center... Uh, Breakthrough, central breakthrough, very powerful stuff. Based on the pin, white can only take once. Because now after bishop e4, knight e4, sorry, twice, but not thrice. Because then comes the pin. And so now white rather belatedly castles. But unfortunately it's too little too late. After knight takes, knight takes d3. The d-pawn proves to be triumphant. Queen d1, trade, trade. And queen f6, another tempo on the rook. And then rook d8, rook knight d4. It's just a beautiful game. Black plays so aggressively, so beautifully. The black piece is just flooding in and uh, deciding the game in a marvelous fashion. Queen c6 check. Highlighting the weakness of the king. f3 is forced. Now comes rook e3. And uh, black just rips apart the defense. Look at this. Look at this amazing centralization. Such a beautiful game. Queen f1, h4 takes... And rook g4 check once again, uh, exploiting the pin. King f1 and the coup de grace. Rook takes f3. And if rook takes, we have got check. Queen takes, take the queen, take the rook. An incredible finish. But actually, scrap that. We have got a mate here. Queen takes, queen takes, and mate. Whoopsie daisies. And so this is going to be... Um, our video about the Benoni structure. So one more time, I would like to give you a bit of a summary because I think it's very important to have it clearly in our mind who is playing for what. So once again, White traditionally likes to play for f4, e5 and break free with e5 whenever possible. Usually Black tries to break up with a6, b5. We like to stop it with a4. The c4 square is something I haven't mentioned that the white knight really likes to occupy via this maneuver and then hurt the d6 pawn. Black, in strong contrast, likes to play for a6, b5. We would like to do our very best to hold the e5 break. We like to trade at least one pair of pieces, preferably this bishop. The bishop always gets fianchettoed. And on the odd occasion, we can also bite into the center with f5. I'm very quickly going to show you an example of that. This is the so-called Zamish um, variation. Um, a6, a4, knight d7, knight g3. Um, let's go with rook e8, bishop e2, h5, castles, h4, knight here, and then white plays knight h1, and then next f5, trying to challenge the center, which is currently very nicely protected by this uh, beautiful pawn chain. So this is a point where f5 can easily become a plan. So this was my summary for you about the Benoni structure. It is a lot more complex and a lot more dynamic one than the French. The French is a very rigid structure. The pawns are sort of uh, linked together. Whereas here, although these two pawns are linked together, but this is mobile and so are these. And so the dynamic features are a lot more prevalent than in the French structure. So I hope that you guys found it useful and I'm going to be back with more soon. Thanks for watching.